Explore a Verizon retail career in the San Francisco Bay Area and get a $1,500 sign-on bonus. Join the team that makes in-store experiences special by connecting customers with the perfect product every time. We offer standout benefits, including competitive pay, day one health and insurance benefits, $8,000 a year in college tuition assistance, plus bonus opportunities. Apply at verizon.com slash retail jobs. Again, that's verizon.com slash retail jobs. Verizon, it's better here. Verizon is an equal opportunity employer. As she leaves, she literally countercrosses with a chicken like a checkoff play. She, <laughs> she goes one way and the chicken crosses the other. I was so certain that we were going to like follow the chicken and the chicken was going to do a monologue. Like, and now I have four stocks of corn. I can finally buy the bodega next to this other chicken. And then just like add six more chicken based characters to this movie. I was ready for it. There's never been a better reason for a crazy billionaire to give us money. <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema in an effort to soften the mortality blow. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting to my immediate left is my good friend, Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Thank you, Noah. Nollywood. We're doing more Nollywood. Oh, yes, sir, we are. And sitting Exciting. 81 miles to my right is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Then you must be an under-nodded nod, Noah. Such an asshole. <laughs> For where? <laughs> Who never? <laughs> so we, I mean, you know, it's it. That is what we just watched for an hour. I will forgive you for that. So Heath, I think we've dropped quite a few hints, and let's face it, it's always on the title of the fucking episode anyway. But just for formality's sake, tell us what will we be breaking down today? All right, we watched Wicked Vultures. Yeah, baby. It's part three of the Vultures of Horror series, or actually. Part one of part two, which is the sequel to part two of part one. It's almost impossible to figure out the order of these on Google. It's very difficult. Anyway, this one's your typical story about local elections, purchasing a female, flea market, voodoo economics, <laughs> and flaming skeleton demons. But literally not a single wicked vulture. So kind of a huge tease there. Yeah, no shit. There has been a, a, a dearth of vultures in these fucking movies. And Eli... How bad was this, let's say, movie? Well, if you like Vultures of Horror 1 and 2, this is going to try your patience. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's getting hard. It is. <laughs> it's getting hard. Less and less After Effects fire and more and more people talking behind that boss's back about how great he is again. <laughs> It's, 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 I, I will, I will admit we're, we're spreading the vulture thing thin. I have high hopes for four though. You know, there's, oh, we just, we know from the, you know, eventually on reels that some good shit is coming. Just not yet. So before we even get started, I want to ask, and I think we've kind of already spoiled the, the, uh, the answer on this one, but of the three vulture flicks so far, where does this one rank? Oh, uh, tied for last. Sure. <laughs> That's where I have it. I gotta go with second place. I gotta oh, go really? with second place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we got two pieces of voodoo, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have we have two really fantastic special effects moments and <laughs> the single best costuming moment. I think we oh, can yes. agree of any movie we've watched. So bright side here, <laughs> there is the craziest costume across all movies. <laughs> And not just that we've reviewed or that we've seen or that we're All aware of. Film. Yeah, and we, we reviewed a movie where three people show up dressed as Batman for no fucking reason, and I'm not <laughs> arguing with Eli. So I, I feel like this might be our last chance to say something nice about this flick. Are there any categories of uh, you know where of these three movies you think this takes first place? Uh, I'm going to say it's the most realistic. Uh, primarily because pretty much nothing happened, but still, technically a win. Most realistic. Oh, there you go. Uh, can I go with less obsession over microphone placement? I feel like they really went, you know, much, much more cash on where they placed the microphones. <laughs> and I just had best background chickens. Um, oh, that's true. Very well behaved in this one. Um, okay, and of course, is there anything that you guys would like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? 
uh, best worst mic placement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Every scene has, I think, two of them. One is shoved inside the actor, <laughs> and the other is a spy tech eavesdropper cone toy from about <laughs> half a mile away. Oh, so yeah. bad. Uh, I'm going to go with best, worst, least understandable dialogue. So little behind the scenes for people here. The way that we cue each, because one of us always watches the movie first. We don't watch it simultaneously. The way we cue each other that we're changing to a different scene in our notes is we write the first line of the next scene. And Noah watched this one first. So throughout the movie, it starts with him giving the first line. And then it's like, tuk, tuk, bandock, your <laughs> guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Different people are on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. That was the hardest thing about this movie for me. I would, I honestly, I would go back over it like two or three times and go, okay, but what does it sound like? You know, <laughs> <laughs> what is the Joe Cocker misheard lyric for this one? All right. Well, I, I think I've made my rampant vulture holism clear already. I can only go so long before my next fix. So we're going to pause for a quick break. And when we come back, we'll break down all the interstitial inaction that is wicked vultures. For those new to the show, we should explain that the Vultures of Horror movies are essentially a Nigerian Christian slash voodoo soap opera that was recommended by a listener that we will never thank enough. It's just exactly the kind of no-budget, head-scratching nonsense we love. But just to make sure we don't lose anybody in our breakdown of Episode 3, we want to take a second to catch you up on the first two episodes. So before we get started, we'd like to present... Previously on Vultures of Horror... After a brief chicken-sacrificing stint with the Cleveland Indians in 1989, Kwame returned to his homeland of Nigeria, where he hoped he could use his fame to be elected to the coveted position of village chief. But despite a magical ritual that included turning a kid into a skeleton while Kwame held his head in his hand and spouted flames from his decapitated neck hole, the village elders passed him over and elected the previous chief's son, Mr. Lucky, to the position. Meanwhile, Kwame's youngest son was desperately trying to fuck Rose. After a brief courtship ended with swollen testicles, Rose explained that she just couldn't be with a person who lacked ambition and had no money. Because the person who can't seem to meet another human in a location that isn't covered in garbage and feral chickens doesn't like poor people. So she gives him an ultimatum. Either he comes up with a thousand Nigerian dollars to prove he can afford her vagina, or she'll say goodbye forever. And on the other side of the moral divide, Kwame's brother, Shrinky Dink LeBron James, is working on a deal or something and constantly gets large sums of money from poorly defined projects. Known for his generosity, moral rectitude, and monochromatic acting skills, he has a wife and two kids and never plays any kind of relevant role in any of these stories despite being their main character. Also, Kwame has a daughter, Quinn, who's in her sophomore year at Disney Princess University. And Quinn has a stalker, as well as the ability to summon laser vultures to do her evil bidding. But she's not the only one who can summon computer-generated devil birds to do her bidding. Kwame's wife also calls upon the powers of the great Chakra Kiki, part-time lord of all that is evil, part-time bassist in a glam rock cover band, to subtly influence the buying decisions of Nigerian bodega shoppers. Also, there's a fat lady that wakes up occasionally just to make you go, wait, was that all a dream then? And if so, how much of it was a dream sequence? The whole movie or what? And two people who scream at a cross in a field. And evil balloons that make children disappear or catch them like a pokeball. It's not clear. And now that it all makes perfect sense, we can get back to breaking down episode three of the Vultures of Horror Nonology, or however the hell many of them there are. Also, you're going to Google first language Nigeria a whole bunch. And it's English. It's, it's, it's English. It's pidgin English. It's a, it's a perfectly legitimate language. That is their word. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown. And I have to say, as soon as I see that Ibaka TV logo... I start feeling a little tingly inside. You know, <laughs> we just raised twenty five grand for charity. We debunked one of the most dangerous movies ever made. I'm just I'm melting back into my recliner, thinking, "Damn it, I have earned this shit." <laughs> this is for us. This yeah. is for us. <laughs> so once again, we're going to start with the uh, you know this preview scene, and then go straight to the credits for this movie without any previews. That's kind of 
Vulture's thing. Mm -hmm. We also get the uh, flaming laser credits again uh, <laughs> yeah. with the same sound effect, introducing each name over and over because, you know, <laughs> that's killer. It's like a wealthy 10 year old designed his website. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a middle school project was to make a porn intro. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird project. All right, now, Mr. Banderson wants you all to make a little intro for my home movies. <laughs> uh, my wife was very beautiful at one point. <laughs> You can't tell from this uh, from this video. So th then we're going to go right into the cold open with Kwame on his porch, and I guess they stole, like, the Karate Kid 2 opening. They're just playing the previous scene, for, uh, like, the last scene from the previous episode. <laughs> Right, yeah. and I want to point out, this movie has a phone number at the bottom, like all great films. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, just a couple of notable things, uh, and you know, they're, they're basically doing the same scene as last time. Hey, we elected Mr. Lucky, and I'm mad about that, but uh, the makeup was done by someone whose last name is for the number real. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> It's not the most bizarre credit we're going to get, but since the credits last about nine minutes into this 58-minute flick, I, I, I've got some notes later on about them as well, <laughs> like two scenes from now. Uh, yeah, and uh, I enjoyed the uh, cartoonishly large golden throne. That's where we start on his shitty little porch. <laughs> and uh, Kwame, uh, Pedro Serrano guy, he, he turns on some Nigerian soft jazz emo music. Which was nice Which of him. Very, it sounds like I'm on hold with like the vulture safety hotline. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. And of course, we've got to remind you, of course, we mentioned this when we did vultures too, but behind him on his porch is a great Shaka Rakiki poster, a poster for his evil demon lord that he worships. As though it was cut out of Teen Beat magazine. Yeah, and I'm just saying, this is the cleanest image we get of that poster. So if anyone wants to recreate it, we will turn it into a t-shirt and make it available for purchase. I'm just <laughs> saying. <laughs> we'll talk to our lawyers first. But yeah, I, I can't. I, I just I don't want to wind up in Nigerian prison. And I just want to remind you, and of course, again, we're just doing a scene we've already done here. But I want to just remind everybody that during this argument that, that he's going to have with the village elder and the guy who was just elected chief... The movie makes very clear that the good guys in this movie are pro witch hunting and the bad guys are against that because they're witches. But that does mean that the movie <laughs> is pro witch hunting. Yeah. Right. And uh, just to remind everybody who we're talking about, the two good guys, that's the cab driver in camo pajamas <laughs> and Wesley Snipes in a kimono. Yeah. Right? Right? Do I have that right? And a stolen fedora. Well, uh, yeah, that, I believe he stole it from Enormous. Woody from Toy Story. <laughs> yeah. Tiny ass little hat on this giant fucking head. It's hilarious. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, costumes in this movie by Chris Brown. And yes, I believe it is the Chris Brown. That would make <laughs> a lot of sense. <laughs> and uh, they start right away with the ridiculous audio. It's It's switching between the wide shots and close ups. It might even be worse than the last movie with this thing. And like next time we're going to hear the Doppler effect. Just all the mics like <laughs> flying by on motorcycles. It's so rough. I just wrote my notes. That's the clipping I've come to know and love. <laughs> um, and of course we get this great, this great blocking moment because they come over with like a peace offering. They come over with a, a bottle of booze for the guy, which is apparently the only gift that anyone ever gives anyone in Nigeria is a bottle of booze uh, or olive oil. Um, uh, just call back to the last one. Um, but anyway, but they forget the booze on the porch and they have this weird blocking moment where he's yelling at him to get away, but then they have to go back and get it. And he's, so he starts yelling at him to go get it. It's anyway. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Amazing. He's instructing them to get their useless bodies out of his house. And I wrote in my notes, the time Eli and Heath had a threesome at QED story. <laughs> <laughs> but then they have to go back, like like the actors. Like, they're not going to do another mm -hmm. take, but the actors are like, oh, I forgot the prop. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll see you at craft services. <laughs> and then finally we get our music fix. Vultures of horror. Oh, I love it. Lady Smith Black Mombaza with auto tuner. Yeah. They're back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And we see Kwame's son uh in a pretty sweet looking prison cell. I mean, that's a I, nice <laughs> looking prison cell. Well, I, I feel like it, this is supposed to be shithole apartment for Nigeria, but I just want to say, like, I've seen people pay nine hundred bucks a month for a walk in closet with a fridge in the bedroom, and I bet his <laughs> isn't even a walk up. You can kind of tell from the window. 
Yeah. But yeah, now this is, we, we called him Superman in the last episode because he was wearing a Superman shirt at some point, and I don't believe they ever say his name. So Superman was the guy who was trying to raise enough money to fuck his girlfriend in the last movie. Right. right. And it, it was like, it was like 85 cents or like $3 yeah. when we did the calculation <laughs> yeah, exactly. last time. Uh-huh. But now it's a thousand SETI in Ghana currency. That's like $240. Are they in Ghana now? That's like two countries over. What happened? <laughs> well, the, the part in Nigeria was a dream, I do believe. We established that at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. But he's he's getting the money together by selling all of his belongings, and <laughs> we're supposed to see him appraising his computer, but he's just looking at it like he's going to use it to smash open a coconut. Like it's <laughs> a charity was- <laughs> gone terribly long. Here you go, champ. <laughs> I honestly thought he was checking Eli's get Superman laid GoFundMe from from when we did the second one, but he wasn't. No, he's looking to sell that laptop to raise the thousand bucks he needs to fuck his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, also, by the way, somebody just took out a lightsaber in the next room. <laughs> they don't address this. Would have been exciting. No. He's monologuing to himself, and he says, she better love me and give me her whole life or I'll be bad. Yep. Those are the exact words. Yep. Those are the lines. Those are my motivations for later. Yeah. And then his, as if we hadn't made that obvious enough, his brother, Steve, uh, Kwame's other son, comes in and demands to know why he's packing up all his stuff so he can explain to him, too, that he's selling it for pussy money. Yeah. <laughs> right. And the brother, at the end of this, he starts talking about, well, a giant plot hole. He's like, why doesn't my stupid brother just use our evil vulture magic to get this girl? <laughs> Right? A very good he, question. He literally says, this is like a stupid thing in a movie. Turns the camera, Please send food. <laughs> I just wrote like, well, not a movie, but yeah, it's like a stupid thing in a video anyway. Also, it's a tiny moment, but when Starvin Marvin walks in the room, the actor doesn't know what to do. So he puts his leg up on the edge of the bed like he's a 1920s cartoon trying to hail a cab. <laughs> and it is the silliest thing in the world. If anyone was wondering what the silliest thing in the world was, it's the footage of that full grown man with his leg up like Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> Also, I believe this is my last credits. No, we're seven minutes and, and, and 25 seconds into this movie, and the credits are still going at the bottom. Um, but the, this last one that I have is this director, Chidi Anyanwu Chidox. Then in parentheses, it says, The Legal Entertainer, which makes you wonder, what kind of trouble did the guy who directed the last one get into? <laughs> what reputation were they running away from here? Also, uh, speaking of the credits, which are, yes, like you said, still going, some of them happen in white letters in front of a person wearing an all white shirt and you just can't like see it at all it's trick. invisible <laughs> credits but they yeah. did not notice <sighs> And in case we didn't drive the point home with that four and a half minute scene, after it's over, after he leaves to go sell his stuff, Steve, Starvin' Marvin, sits there saying, like, I don't think he should be doing this thing where he sells all his belongings for his girlfriend. And as if that's not enough, the next scene is going to start with him sitting in a fucking field going, I just sold everything for my girlfriend. (laughs) Just sitting on a log explaining the last scene to myself and laughing like I totally sold my stuff and raised the money to purchase my girlfriend sure did <laughs> look at all this money also um, this is the scene that has the most wandering chickens in it so yes. I didn't hear anything that the actor said it doesn't matter but there is some amazing chicken acting going on in the background <laughs> just in case you wonder well, you know, it's funny because it's always when we when these two characters meet that we have maximal background chickens. And I wonder if that's like a rider in her contract or if like <laughs> this actress just carries her chickens with her everywhere she goes. Oh, like, you know, like Will Smith's posse. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so she just has to have them in all the scenes with her. I, I don't know. There's probably a reason. You know, it's a little little uh, Easter egg there somewhere or something like that. But at any rate, yeah. So they meet in. The chicken walking park. Um, and he explains, you know, to her what he just explained to Himself. no one <laughs> before she showed up. Right. And he was supposed to get a thousand dollars, but he only got nine hundred and fifty. So she's pleased, but you know, she wants the other fifty before <laughs> she <does>. she'll <laughs> fuck him. <laughs> she says very explicitly to him, Don't think that sex you'd be some making. and i'm just thinking okay like i'm sorry but you could get so much pussy for a grand in nigeria right i mean that's the only reason for nigeria right 
Anyway, I don't know. Seems, <laughs> seems, seems like he's overpaying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Hey, look, I'm not going to run for fucking president. That's the difference. I know don't the microphone's on. That's don't the you difference. judge me. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? You were here for loving the bad man. You were all here for loving the bad man. So, so she shoves the money into her tits and tells him to fuck off until he's got the other 50 bucks. And then she wanders off and he's just so pleased with himself. He's like, yep, nailed it. And this is the most important thing in the world. As she leaves, she literally counter crosses with a chicken like a checkoff play. She, <laughs> she goes one way and the chicken crosses the other. I was so certain that we were going to like follow the chicken and the chicken was going to do a monologue. Like, and now I have four stocks of corn. I can finally buy the bodega next to this other chicken. And then just like add six more chicken based characters to this movie. I was ready for it. There's never been a better reason for a crazy billionaire to give us money. <laughs> never. Yeah. All right. So now we cut to Kwame skulking in his backyard. And I'm sure this is in everyone's notes here. But the, remember the big giant gold throne he had in his front porch? He has a matching one in his backyard. How many of these does he have? <laughs> I don't know. Or does he just carry around the one? Right. Like, it's crazy. And now I want to see inside the house. Like he's got a toilet version, a little potty training one for the kid. A lazy he's got a car boy. one as the driver's seat. Yeah. <laughs> see, I wrote in my notes, he's so mad, he moved his throne to his backyard. I, right. <laughs> and of course, he's monologuing about the last scene he was in. Yeah, I wrote right. my notes. I think Kwame's going to start singing Sunrise Sunset because he goes, <laughs> how could a young man who I knew so shortly ago to be a young boy is now the chief village chief village chief? And I was just like, oh, I get it. Cue the file in. <laughs> And then he gets instantly surrounded by his sons. The two sons appear from opposite sides of the house and, like, converge <laughs> yeah. on him. And, and I want to point out, these characters, still more likable than the Trump family. Just throw them out there. <laughs> I like his children. They're able. <laughs> I say able. This question is hard. <laughs> And with, when the two sons show up, I want it, I want him to like fold out two more giant golden thrones. Yeah, like, right. <laughs> you know, folding chairs back. No. <laughs> Slightly smaller, there. but yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and now basically, it, so we get Kwame skulking and, and monologuing about how he should be the village chief. Then the sons show up and each of them says, I think you should be the village chief. And then they all three together say that they think he should be the village chief and, yeah. uh, and then plot <laughs> together. And now we're back to mom's shop, Kwame's wife's shop, for more supernatural bodega competition. Now, okay, so in each of these films so far, this woman has enacted another wily Coyote esque manner of magically thwarting the more popular bodega next to her. Uh, right. Sorry, Noah. I hate to disagree with you, but Wiley Coyote used more <laughs> than one idea. What this woman does <laughs> right. is notices notice her business is bad, pull out a pot from Zelda, <laughs> eat a full of After Effects fire. She yells at it, and then something bad happens to the other woman momentarily. Right. But but this time, uh, Mister Lucky, the chief elect, he shows up at the marketplace right. to make sure there's no. Dark magic corrupting the economy. <laughs> and obviously, you know, one of the giant sectors of this economy is a cluster of two exactly the same canned tomato cement bag and condom stores. <laughs> That's the important thing to police here. And, and there's this moment where he first pulls up. This is the kind of shit you only get in the Vulture series. So, she goes to open the, 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 car door, door? the car door and it's locked <laughs> so she can't. And then he unlocks it so she goes to open it again. But he's already opening it now. <laughs> he could have he could have opened the door and cracked her skull open. They would have kept this cake. Oh, yes. Didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you only get that level of fuck up in these films. <laughs> this is also where we learn he's working on a Wuta Poje, which is water project. <laughs> but I rewound this movie 84 times to figure out that he meant Water Project. I just want to throw that out there. When you hear it, it's Water Project. Yeah. And so, but what we're really setting up here, so Mr. Lucky shows up and talks to the evil competitor lady that, or not, the, I'm sorry, the good Christian competitor lady that the evil wife is always trying to fuck with with her Zelda pot. He drives off, and then she busts out the Zelda pot. 
right to to call upon the great Shakara Kiki to steal her customers again and apparently give her a really bad Charlie horse. <laughs> that, that's, that's the effect this time. Fire pumpkin blow. Her leg hurts. Well, she falls down and starts screaming. And nothing is funnier than the other three actresses trying to drag this actress a foot and a half. Yeah, just, they are just like, oh, God damn well, it. Well, not the same foot no, and a half. No, they drag her in like four different directions <laughs> like they're trying to quarter her. And it obviously is not working very well. <laughs> I also love this great little moment. It cuts back to the uh, to the evil wife just, you know, tee hee hee and about it. And she goes, that is the way these cookies crumbles. <laughs> That's, <laughs> Those are exact words, yes. by the way. Probably best to use idioms you actually know fluently. No big deal. But can. then, as if to spite me after making that note, she says, goodbye to bad rubbish to finish it off. <laughs> Yeah. I Fantastic. felt like she was going to pull up a bag of the bottom of the aisle cereal and be like, cookies crumbles from Nigeria. It's not chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So now we're going to cut to a couple of chicks. And, 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 correct me if I'm wrong. This is the good bodega Charlie horse lady's daughter and Rose, correct? The the because and the reason I ask this is I'm not I'm, I, I want to be very clear about this so it doesn't sound like I think all Nigerian women look the same. But they film this with the sun behind the characters, so you can't see any of their facial features. You're just aware that there are two women. And yeah, and it's a walk and talk minus the talk. It's just the walk. There's no audio for like right. The first their lips five are moving. Minutes of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once they stop, we can hear them. It's like a relativity thing. Yeah. Also. Have we met these characters before? Well, that's that's what I'm asking. I, 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 I honestly, I can't tell because you can't really see their faces. One of them's definitely Rose, and then we learn later that one of them is the market lady's okay. daughter. All right, because yeah. Of the phone call she gets. Um, yeah, because eventually they stop walking and 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 stand in one place long enough to have some conversation. And apparently, they're talking about what an awesome chief Mister Lucky is going to make. And as they're doing it, they're visibly getting bitten by hummingbird-sized mosquitoes. <laughs> like they're slapping their skin, like pulling the typhoid out and shit. Yeah. Uh, we also learn at this point that Kwame was on suspension for Gian Saga. Yeah. <laughs> you never figured that one out. Your your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, but but basically, they they've heard that he's an evil vulture summoner or something like that, and they're glad that he didn't become the village chief. Um, and and, and, and honestly, they tell you this as though their lines are being revealed one word at a time from far away. Yeah, like they're reading smoke signals over a hill. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> On a windy day, no less. Um, and then one of them gets a phone call, and it's terrible news. This is when we learn that she's other bodega lady's daughter yeah and by the way she answers the phone like dave Chappelle doing little john it's just what <laughs> so loud there was no time for anyone to give her bad news and i know this happens a lot in the movies we watch but she literally like puts the phone to her ear and she's like my mother has injured her leg yeah it's like who, who told you that <laughs> how do you, do you have a one syllable term for that back <laughs> home so can you just massage it it's a charlie horse whatever <laughs> like what give her water i don't know well, so now we cut to the leg hospital to find out. Uh, and this is my first of Noah, of my favorite notes that Noah put in, which is <laughs> sad, unintelligible wailing is Noah's scene note here, <laughs> which is exactly what it is. It is just yes. a woman being like, Come, my lord, Jaguar. <laughs> this is what they sing at like Bolivian funerals. <laughs> like if your kid dies from shrapnel, you get to do this song for a day and a half. Is that where it comes from? Yeah, they took this sound from Aleppo. <laughs> <laughs> that means lap dance, right, in Spanish? That means Mosul. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. No, right. guys, it's the if dog fast, food. <laughs> if you're fast enough. But, yeah, so this is this is other bodega lady, the, the good Christian lady that's had to thwart, you know, laser vultures and skeletons and all kind of shit in the previous movies. And now she has a really bad Charlie horse. And and her foot has uh, a good deal of glue on it, also. <laughs> yeah, that, that was part of the and magic trick. And this is trick. actually a really terrifying scene because she's it mourning is. the fact that her foot is now got gangrene or whatever it is, and we see the protagonists of this movie going through the bad thinking that causes people to kill other people for being witches. He literally right. turns to him and goes. Nobody who was walking around one day could develop a swollen leg the next day. It must be <laughs> vultures of horror. 
which is one not true <laughs> and two how people in this part of the world end up murdering each other all the time again this is a pro your neighbor is probably a witch film yes <laughs> right. yeah and also i just want to point out okay in this particular instance the the evil sorcerer in question like stands publicly outside with her evil Zelda pot and blows magic CGI fire around while very loudly summoning the great Chakra Kiki. There's not really a whodunit here. <laughs> yeah. And, and just to review, she used this evil magical power, uh, for a low level leg hurting prank. That, that's what <laughs> happened. Yeah. To nominally increase the sales at her bodega. So speaking of which, so now we're going to cut to, you know, the, the bodega the next day or whatever. And she's just raking in customers, which is fucking silly because when we saw him before, there were zero customers between the two do bodegas. So if she gets all of those customers, it's not 26. Yeah. Also, I want to point out, if you watch along with us, which I highly recommend for this one, it's 56 minutes and every moment is a new type of crazy. <laughs> Look at this bodega. Tell me if you can identify any of the products she's selling. I could not. I paused it and sat there staring and I was like, those bags that hang from the wall could be spices, but I don't fucking know. I don't know, those are condoms. I don't the condoms, know what I any of the things in that bodega are. There's some Coca-Cola in there sometimes. There, there were two bottles of Coca-Cola. Yeah. Yeah. And um some large cement bags <laughs> and some canned tomatoes. <laughs> and condoms. We already and went condoms. through this. This is what you need. Also, okay, so we start this off and it what we're supposed to see is she's got a lot of customers. But they start with this big crowd of customers and we watch this scene all the way through her helping all of these customers. Like I wrote in my note several times, Oh my god, we're gonna watch her cash all these people out, aren't we? And we <laughs> do. <laughs> Some old woman comes up, starts to count coins into her hands. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Coupons. You have coupons? You're going to cut those now? You didn't cut those ahead of time? Come on. I bought this here last week, and uh, yeah. So, and, and then, so, the, and the payoff for all this, the reason we have to watch her cash out 21 customers is so that we can then watch her cackle evilly to herself <laughs> and, and 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 again and we've we brought this up in every one of these movies now but like her big plan with her magical crippling power is to increase bodega says like you could just cripple people and then run up to them and take their money yeah. right yeah. <laughs> vultures with laser beams is part of her set of powers just <laughs> make that perfectly clear to everybody yes and okay so now we're done with that storyline for basically this entire movie now we're going to go back to the dorm room where kwame's daughter goes the the 10 year old girl college dorm room ah this is <laughs> famber nash <laughs> <laughs> i had her as black shannon doherty i, I had her as black Sinead o'connor so yeah we're all around it yeah yeah exactly and if, as you'll recall in the last one she was dealing with this stalker dude that really wanted to fuck her that she was not interested in and a professor who really wanted to fuck her that she was not interested in why in the world does everybody in this movie want to fuck her? No idea. And also, if she has a rapey professor, why does she decide to go see that person at the end? <laughs> of the, like, that's not the best plan, I would say. You make a call or you call the, like, you know, authorities. I don't know. Well, she got, you see, her friend, who is a runner-up on RuPaul's drag face, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, comes in and gives her her test results. And apparently her test results are out of 10? And she got a three out of ten, and so she's going to go talk to her professor about it. Crazy fucking stupid. I wish she doesn't walk into any solid objects along the way. Don't they give you four out of ten for writing your name? That's what I heard. <laughs> well, and she goes, she's like, I'm not taking this. And her roommate goes, what are you going to do? And I'm just like, magic vultures is what she's going to do, bitch. We get the fucking vultures <laughs> of horror movie, uh, music going again, the auto-tuning. And I got all excited. Uh, it was a little too early. And, and I mean, uh, and who can blame me for getting excited, right? Because this is where we finally meet the rapey professor cra character, Cornell West Jr. And in all of the, you know, coming uh, on the next Vultures of Horror, they keep showing this guy being tormented by flying chairs and chased by vultures and shit. <laughs> we finally get to see him. He looks exactly like a five year old wearing a Cornell West costume. <laughs> like he's wearing his dad's pants. They're way too long. The belt wrapped around his waist like six times. You can see the rubber band going behind his head. Ridiculous beard being held up. It's, it's terrible. Yeah, could not look more like Halloween Adventures black guy disguise. 
Also, another great Noah note here uh, to intro this scene. You see, Quinn, you're the one person yourself. Arrow, wild guess at what he's saying. (laughs) (laughs) And again, I watched this multiple times. I was like, no, I got to get this right so the guys will know what the hell scene up. Oh, my fucking God. So, yeah. So she's there to tell him off for giving her a bad grade. And he's there to speak in just like random shouted syllables. Like he doesn't even emphasize like like his words don't even stop at the end of the words, but rather midway through a syllable and then start up on the it's real. It's really hard to explain, but it's bizarre the way this guy's delivering his line. His pauses are incredible. How dare you? Two, three. <laughs> speak to me in that manner. I actually have the same thing. I was like, how dare you, parentheses, goes for a drink, comes back, speak to me that way. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like a bad guy in a kung fu movie. Just yell. It's like someone put random punctuation all over his lines, and he just read them anyway, exactly <laughs> as is. How dare you cut break for lunch? Say that to me. <laughs> that's, oh, that's fucking unreal. There's also a great moment where he basically explains to Fan Bernatch that if she doesn't allow him to slip witch Jew... <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna fail her i i, I want to point out too just so you have the proper visual this is a big chick right like she looks like she could play like left tackle for the vikings or something this is a big girl and the dude is incredibly tiny he's like urkel in a beard yeah he's african kevin hart yeah, she could whip that fucking dude's ass. So it's so funny to watch her like bowing up on it. It's like, you don't need vultures. <laughs> also, the music this guy listens to apparently in his office is crazy. It's this like creepy pipe organ music. <laughs> like if the Phantom of the Opera swung in on a chandelier, it would not be weird at all in this scene. Yeah, do totally you like this music? I got it from a haunted circus. <laughs> right. exactly. The elephant died. It was murder. <laughs> But also, okay, so because, like, this is how the conversation essentially goes. She's like, how dare you only give me a three? And he's like, you are too disrespectful. And she says, you will beg for death, but you will never find it. That's her actual line. I'm like, man, that escalated. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, that's like a presidential debate. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had those meetings in a professor's office hours where you threaten to torture them into, into eternity without a chance for the respite of death. I get it. I get it. <laughs> And then she leaves so that we can, and so that we can listen to like all the other characters in this movie. After someone leaves, they have to talk about the previous scene for a few seconds on camera. Oh, and, he, he keeps yelling for a good five minutes oh, at yeah, nobody. Yeah. yeah. And every word he's yelling is clearly one that he's never seen before now. His pronunciation on effrontery is amazing. There's like 31 syllables in it. Yeah. It's <laughs> effrontery. He <laughs> front tree. Me and it. this guy went to the same pronunciation school. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> just me and him in a classroom of two with someone at the front being like Chimera. <laughs> <He's> front tree. <laughs> and now we cut to three drunk guys. This would be Quinn Stalker and his two buddies. Okay, and there's no reason for them to be. Dr- they're they're drinking from seven different full beers yeah, right. <laughs> that they have not. Drunk at all, and they've already opened them, though. They're just sitting there. Yeah. No, it's amazing how often they get, like, bottle goes in liquid, liquid goes in person wrong in these kind of movies. And it doesn't even divide evenly. If Like, it's three guys and seven beers. If there were nine, it might be slightly more reasonable. Or some of them were empty, maybe. Yeah. Also, I want to point out that this is two movies in a row we've done that feature nighttime sunglass debauchery. Mm, That's true. And one of the friends is singing a drinking song, and he notices that his friend isn't, like, singing along. I don't know what it is he's supposed to be motivated by, but he's like, Oh, de go, see. Come on, man, what's wrong with you? I'm doing my famous <laughs> go to go sing song, and you're just not even into this. Why do we get together? Do you want to split this last beer, all three of us, on this one beer or not? <laughs> So. And one of these guys is Quinn Stalker, right? The like, yeah, kind of yeah. mainish guy. He is the hardest to understand, maybe in this entire movie. He has both this very difficult Nigerian English accent with, I think, a Scottish accent. At, at points, it changes, but here, it's Scottish. It's very difficult. Yeah, he has a Scottish, Jamaican, Nigerian accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. And I have to do line cues from him. Holy shit. And, and, and of course, he's talking about how Quinn still won't fuck him despite the fact that he's bought her shit and everything. And he's really pissed about that. To which his roommate says, yeah, if I were you, I would bury her alive. 
<laughs> no. What? That's his line. I mean, not move on and find another girl. Bury her alive. <laughs> I, I, maybe that's a figure of speech in Nigeria. It's I feel like it's not, talk. though. It's locker room <laughs> talk. All guys do it. <laughs> this this episode was topical when we recorded it, guys. I just want to point that out. <laughs> now, and, and, but, but, but the point is that he hates everything about her. So now his – and he says, like, he's like, I don't want to go out with her anymore. But now how am I going to explain all the money I spent on her without getting my tip wet? So his friend, the one who just recommended burying her alive, says, I have a plan. Let's whisper about it like cartoon characters. <laughs> but here's what's right. amazing. He goes, I have a plan. But then they didn't. The one time you heard something you weren't supposed to in this movie, <laughs> the actor's very clearly going. <laughs> but really, that's what they're, they're that's what they're saying when they're speaking out loud, too. man. Come on. Let's be fair. <laughs> Also, um, this main Scottish Jamaican guy has so much adult acne. It's cra- like it's visibly festering like the top of a cauldron out of his face. <laughs> and uh, one other thing, they're, they're all smoking cigarettes that get bigger and smaller every time yeah, the shot yeah. changes. <laughs> like sometimes it's a cigar, then it's a giant Sherlock pipe back to a cigarette. It's It's crazy. So and the the key here though is that the stalker guy ag- agrees with the other dude's plan, which I believe is to gang rape her. Yep. So, which means that that's what he whispered, right? He, he whispered, he's like, we could all gang rape her. And the other guy's like, yeah, I guess, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's just, yeah, interesting to wonder how that dialogue goes exactly. And now we get to the most difficult line cue that I had to do for the entire fucking movie. <laughs> all, the best I could do was <laughs> gift, gifter, mumble, humble, burf. And then no fucking clue. LeBron James is checking his phone. I just gave up at this point. But now we're finally back with the happy good family. Shrinky Dink LeBron James and his kids and wife and everything. And he's talking to his maid, who it turns out is his foster daughter, whose name is Gifty. Gifty? Gifty? Maybe. Or she was given to him as a gift and he just still calls her that. I don't know. I get it. (laughs) It's one or the other. But yeah, yeah. And she was given to him, though. Like he says that, like when when her parents died and he took control of her, it was like, you know, I wanted to, you know, you to see me as a father. It's like, oh, well, you know, she's your maid. So (laughs) that's not what a father would do with his daughter. But at any rate, generally foster children. And look, I don't know. Generally, foster children aren't employed by the family they stayed with. (laughs) And he, he says, are you okay? You look sad and troubled. I wrote my notes. He has unrealistic dialogue if he were playing someone's first attempt at a robot. <laughs> <laughs> but she won't tell him what's wrong. Instead, she goes back to wiping the couch with a towel. Well, he definitely just wants to fuck her, right? That's like, it was definitely like, like yeah. oh, why are you sad? As in, like, is it because you need some dick? Like, it seems like that's a yeah, not enough I dick had, frown. Yeah, I had this as the beginning of a porn down as well. Okay. Yeah, I was hoping for the same, but no. Um, and, and, and instead of just resolving that here and now, we actually go to a second scene about the same thing where he makes a second attempt to ask her what's wrong in a slightly different location that was visible from the location of the first scene. And a louder place too. It's a much higher volume part of the room. It's a much room. louder More part echoey. of the room. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they needed. She reveals to him that her younger sister has been turned into a prostitute by her aunt. Yeah. And that her mom warned them especially not to be prostitutes. She says, <laughs> like it was, and she says it like it was her dying request. Like before my mom died, she asked us to always love our family and not to be hookers. Yeah. And also, I, I want to point out too, because in this movie, of course, because they're writing it, it all pays off. But, but leading into this, like he asks her like eight times, what's wrong? And she's like, it's personal. What's wrong? It's personal. And I wanted her to go vaginal itch. <laughs> like at a certain point, it's a personal problem, especially from a woman when you're a man. It's an invitation to shut the fuck up, but not in this movie, apparently. Yeah. So yeah, but her sister's being whored now. But don't worry, he's gonna unwhore her. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then the very end of the conversation, she's like, "Okay, so that's all settled. Uh, go back to sweeping." Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> he makes her go back to work. He said, "It's amazing because he's on one of these like squeaky leather couches where every <laughs> time you move on it, and he goes wipe your tears, and then goes to move towards her, and it's like." <laughs> <laughs> so even if this was fucking Meryl Streep and Robert De Niro, it is hilarious. 
<laughs> yeah. So now that he's promises to take care of the whoring, she can get back to fucking work. I wouldn't even give her a break after that. It's pretty fucking cold blooded. And keep in mind that this character is supposed to be like, we're only seeing this scene so we can be reminded how good and generous this guy is. Yeah. So now we cut to his office and I have to shame myself for just a minute for immediately recognizing that that's his receptionist and this is his office. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of his assistants comes in and and there's good news in an envelope and he's really happy so he runs off to tell everybody about it yeah and everybody is apparently in a school computer lab from 1995 <laughs> <laughs> I had a room full of computer monitors hooked up to eight track players but similar yeah now eight track player how many is that a computer that only plays eight mp3s at a time <laughs> that's it's very close to that actually like a yes. race car so <laughs> Yeah, you stick your feet out the bottom and then it plays music. <laughs> yeah, oh. more or less. So, but his assistant. Okay, so now this is if, if this is uh, his evil-looking, creepy assistant that clearly doesn't have his best interest in mind from the last couple or whatever. Um, him and another guy that works for him are talking, and apparently they don't make this very clear. But apparently, the two of them have come up with a good plan to defraud the Nigerian government out of millions of dollars. That, that's well, what. Yeah. That's what I got. Yeah. Yeah, their plan is they've been given $300,000 to build a power plant, which is terrifying in itself. <laughs> yeah, no but they've been given $300,000, and their plan is to keep it. Like, that's their brilliant fucking just Superman 2-esque plan. It's just like, and what we do <laughs> is we don't build a power plant at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's the perfect crime. <laughs> yeah, who would suspect the people we gave that money to, I guess. <laughs> Enron did it. Well, we that's true. It. No, it has worked in Nigeria before. They are the smartest guys in the room. But they but but that's the thing is they sit there and they plot about it like, oh, all this money and then they play, and one of them says, Wait a minute, wait a minute, will our Boy Scout boss just steal hundreds of thousands of dollars? I don't I bet he won't. Three hundred thousand dollars. Like, there's something about the fact that each of them would have gotten a hundred thousand dollars out of this that's so weirdly depressed. It's not twenty eight million. It's just like <laughs> it's like three Honda Accords. Well, but, he, but he says the one guy says I'm going to buy a new car and build three houses too. So that's even more frightening. But what's even more amazing is that later on, in fact, one scene later. The guy says, we will all get hundreds of thousands in bonuses. So, like, apparently there's more money in it for them if they don't steal the money than if they do. Who knows? Anyway, <laughs> so, yeah, so we cut to the next scene, and, and it was so nice because in this scene cue, he spells out his line, right? LeBron <laughs> goes, look, guys, the answer is no, N-O, no. And I'm like, do that with all your lines, dude. Help us out here. Yeah, exactly. From now on, new rule. <laughs> But yeah, so basically he's explaining to people that, look, guys, building power plants isn't like debugging windows. You don't just get to keep all the money. <laughs> it's a callback. Um, and, and he completely disagrees with their plan to just be complete and utter frauds uh, in the dumbest possible way. Right. And because if they steal the money, people will hate them and curse their unborn generation's laser noise. Now, yeah, you're going to watch this, and that's exactly what happens. He goes, they'll yes, the unborn generations. Pick you! And I wanted someone with, like, a blaster to be like, I am so, I did not realize this thing was loaded. <laughs> do they load? Is there, are there bullets in here? I haven't. I'll put it down. <laughs> yeah, and this is where he says, but guys, you'll get hundreds of thousands in bonuses. And I'm like, that's more than you were just talking about. Stealing, guys, I don't really get what your motivation is. I mean, you could buy hundreds of Kwame's son's girlfriend with that kind of money. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it, but but I guess apparently it is enough for him because then in the next scene... I want to do leave. all our negotiation from now on in Kwame's son's girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't know, I'm paying like two Kwame's son's girlfriends in rent right now. And I just feel like, you know, we, we're in a one-bedroom apartment. There's got to be like a one... Kwame's son's girlfriend in an apartment in Manhattan, right? That's not crazy. That's not crazy. It is crazy. Um, but so, but now, okay, again, it, keeping with the with the rule of thumb in this movie, which is this scene is going to be us telling you what the next scene is about. This scene is going to be that scene, and the next scene is going to be talking about what that last scene was. Now that we get these two plotting guys coming back out of his office, talking about how moral he is. 
Yeah, he's so great. Any other boss would have just stolen $300,000 from the government, apparently. Yeah, the bar is low in Nigeria, I, I guess. Mean, look, Holy shit. I would steal $300,000 from the National Treasury, but this is why Noah and Heath get to make the decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, no, that's on the that's on the whiteboard. No that's stealing why from the Nigerian to make the government. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're on. We're going to go back to campus so we can wrap up Quinn's story at least for this episode. Um, and I just want to point this out. First of all, this is not relevant to the movie, but just as a quick reminder, bring us back to Earth here. When we get to the to the scene for them, like checking their grades in the foreground, there's this giant like end malaria now get information here thing that just happened to be there where they were shooting so you know it's fun to make fun of this shit and everything but we get it we do get it we understand why you can't spend more money on lighting <laughs> hard to do set dressing when you're like no guys mosquito curtains are number one on the budget <laughs> yeah, right. yeah exactly one. what about taking no, number fucking one you hear me kyle you hear me number one and of course, this you know, and and what we're supposed to be seeing here is that Quinn comes out, looks at her grades, finds out that the guy failed her, and she's really pissed about it. But in order to get there, we have to watch people check their grades for a solid ninety seconds, other than her, before she comes out. And it is so much so that I'm like, who are these characters? Yeah. We don't know these people, and it doesn't matter. We're not supposed to. They're just background characters that got ninety fucking seconds of screen time. I wrote, "Is everyone checking to see who made it into the school play? Is everyone <laughs> checking to see who made it into this movie?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and apparently, okay. So she sees her grade and she's pissed, which means she walked away from that meeting with Cornell West Jr. thinking he had changed his mind. Yep. Right? I mean, didn't she, wouldn't she otherwise have? No, no, but she's apparently surprised. So surprised. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> her face turns into a flaming skeleton. Did I see that correctly? Is that what you're talking what about? What the fuck was okay. that? You know, flaming skeleton time of the month. You don't want to bring it up, so, but you can tell when she's turning into a flaming skeleton. Am I right, fellas? Huh? Holy huh? shit. And and I just I, I can't I can't express this well enough. You have to watch this one to get it. But basically she goes, she turns to the camera, she goes, That man has done his worst. Her head turns into a cartoon fire skull, and then it turns back and she goes, Now it's my turn. <laughs> and I just wrote in my notes, my wrote notes are just like, I deserve this. My dick is lubed. I am so, and, and she starts wandering off all slow motiony. The music note I've got is, oh, they brought a cave troll. I am so fucking ready for her to attack him with telekinetic chairs. Oh, the the video. She's very clearly gonna CGI shark attack him. Exactly. Based on how yes. she's walking up to him out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And also, she is rocking so many pleats at this point. These <laughs> enormous high waisted like Z Cavarici pants. It's fantastic. <laughs> Also, she has a pink noose around her neck, which yeah. is, is that a normal accessory? <laughs> a noose? We have even better wardrobe notes coming, yeah. Um, and so now we get back to Professor Kung Fu Screamer here, um, right. who invites her to do her worst. Like she comes up to him just in the quad or whatever and starts yelling at him. Then that's it. Nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, <All right>. that's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, sorry if I got your hopes up there, but first of all, I, I just, I got the, the fucking audio in this movie. You know, he <laughs> says something about, like, I want to see you do your worst, and she says back to him, so be it, but you can't, you have to, like, turn the volume way up and, tr and, 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 and play it again to know that that's what she says, because all of a sudden there is completely no fucking sound. But, and they didn't even change angles. No. So, like, are they doing that in post? <laughs> are they putting that in? It's crazy. <laughs> Something ran out of batteries or something. Yeah. And they're like, oh, but you know what? So and so was still on the phone. Maybe we can use that. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, but then, yeah. But then she walks away and nothing happens. Yeah. And the professor declaims that he's going to fell her on all her courses. I didn't know professors <laughs> were allowed to do that, but apparently this <laughs> yeah, one is. <laughs> Well, you know, he's got some clout, obviously, with a beard like that. And and, and bef quick before we have to admit that this whole setup completely fails to pay off at all in this movie, let alone in this scene. We're going to pause for a quick break. But before we do, let me give Act 3 the hard sell here. Will they buy a windscreen for their microphone? How about a boom? It can really just be a stick and some duct tape, guys. Or maybe just send me the audio. I will clean it up before you post the next one. I, it would be that easy, guys. I would do it out of the kindness of my heart. 
Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the random and unsatisfying conclusion of Vultures of Horror 3, Wicked Vultures. Sound by no illusions. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? My daughters, come to me. Yes, Moda. Good time, Dave. My daughters, I am about to day. And before I day, I want you to know it is very important to me. Oh, tell us, Moda, anything. And damn, Boom. No. Do no become prostitutes. What? Do no become prostitutes, for it will bring much shame upon our family. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, so uh, that is pretty obvious. No, no, no. Really? No. Really? No, no. Yeah, I, 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 no. I would think it's pretty obvious that being a prostitute in Nigeria is not the career that a mother would hope for her daughters to have. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, hmm. Weird. I, I thought, you know, maybe because, like, the money is so good and you don't have to work that hard, it would be more appealing to you. Okay, well, now it, it sounds like you're trying to sell me on being a, a prostitute. No, 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 just I thought you would be more open to the idea. I was not where you were uh, ideologically, I guess. Well, we, 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 we're not. So is that like your, 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 your dying advice to your totos? Well, it was, and now you made me feel stupid. No, no, it's good advice, Mara. You're, you're just saying that. No, no, really, we won't be prostitutes. Okay. I mean, unless the money is, like, great. <laughs> she gets it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more ethnically sensitive multiculturalism, and we're going to start off with Kwame's good brother LeBron celebrating the big deal or whatever, like he has done in all three episodes so far. <laughs> oh. This company, I swear, like 50% of this company's budget is celebratory champagne. Yeah, but we get to watch someone figure out how to open a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a minute. Which they yeah. serve in wine glasses because Nigeria is terrible. <laughs> and also, it looks more like Coke because it was definitely not white champagne. It was. It looked like a really fancy Coke bottle that has like a wire <laughs> that you have to take off. <laughs> that could be. We don't know. We don't know their culture. Yeah, it's the Mexican Coke. <laughs> and also, like, you know, good luck keeping up here. Um, but apparently we have now fast forwarded months later, but only on this timeline. Other things will happen that are only hours or days later from the other timelines. But it is now months later. And the project that they were going to steal the money from is now done. And they're all getting bonuses for They've it. They've built their $300,000 power plant. Yeah, exactly. It's, In it's gone over super well. How much time was that? Yeah, you to build a power plant or a grid or whatever they were doing? Yeah, they say a power grid. Yeah, exactly. And, and Okay, let's see. Ten chickens and ten wheels for them to run <laughs> on and <laughs> corn to motivate them. A, yeah, I get it. A couple months. A couple months. <laughs> ethnically sensitive multiculturalism. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he goes like, you know, um, you know, we've been able to achieve so much of whatever it is that we were supposed to have just done. We should all celebrate for not being felons and frauds. Big, big pats on the back all around. <laughs> They've got a cake that says not Andrew Wakefield on it. <laughs> <laughs> also, apparently it's LeBron's wife's birthday now. Because why yeah. the fuck not? Wasn't, haven't we already been through it was her birthday in this? Every day's your birthday when you're a beautiful, sensual Nubian bride. <laughs> like, hey, that's what I thought, yeah. So that's that scene. And then we cut to his wife, LeBron's wife, who also runs a shop, but it's a much nicer one than Kwame's wife because she's not a devil worshiper. And this is the best I could do in the line queue on this one. Wow, behold the latest pumpkin curl Shania Twain. Which is actually what she's saying. I, I think script. it is. It could be. It's as likely that as anything else that it sounds like. Yeah. She also uh, got her furniture to do her accounting on at the oh. nicest Toys R Us in Nigeria. <laughs> See? All right. So she literally she's got this composition book, which is, I guess, her books for the for the shop that she runs. And she sits down at this tiny little plastic play school desk in the middle of a grocery store to start doing her books. To keep track of all the juice boxes for grown-ups, which is apparently the only <laughs> thing they sell here. Yep. 
Frutelli is the juice they sell. Yes, yeah, well done, well done. Brothers. Also, no mics for this scene. They went raw, raw dog. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the way they did the sound for this scene was a man ran around the actors in a circle holding up his phone. <laughs> So, okay, so her friend is showing up, and I don't remember if this is the friend that got beaten in the last movie or not, but anyway, it's a friend of hers showing up to take her to lunch, um, and this is such an awkward scene. Anytime a prop is en entered into this script, everything goes right to hell. You know, because yeah. she's got this present, which is, again, a bottle or two of champagne or fancy Coke or whatever to give to her. And she actually hands it to her on two different occasions as here, happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Also... But I tiny note, but behind them on the shelves are yogurt, unrefrigerated yogurt. Yeah. Why don't they refrigerate their fucking yogurt? Is that <laughs> yogurt? Most of my notes for this scene is <laughs> being troubled by what is in those yogurt containers. <laughs> <laughs> if we're lucky, it's just meth or something. Um, but yeah, and also the, the the woman who hands her the birthday present twice also says twice, "I wish you much prosperity and progress." So it's it's so bad that I assume that like that lady thought they were doing two cuts from two different directions, and the dr director just <laughs> disagreed. They got into a fight about it or something. Anywho, so she's going, but she's taking her out to lunch, and and another great moment, just where you realize how little attention they're paying to their own goddamn movie. She gets up and she she turns to the, like the girl that works for, her and she says, "Get my bag, I'm going out with my friend." And then she just walks out the goddamn store without getting a bag. <laughs> but that's a gift for her now. <laughs> I, I guess. Yeah. You know, I bequeath my bag to you. <laughs> and then the sound goes out. <laughs> All of the sound goes out. Yeah, yeah. And now that that pivotal scene is taken care of, in case you were wondering where she had lunch that day, we get the wife showing up late that night at home, which means she had to work all day on her birthday, which kind of sucks. And her husband, a grown up, has cut little red construction paper hearts out for her and put them upon the bed. Yeah, it's supposed to be, well, first of all, she walks into a totally dark room. So I just want to point out this movie is, as it is ending, it is slowly eliminating all the elements that make it a movie. Sound, <laughs> lights, the next scene will have no set. Just want to throw, but it's supposed to be like a rose petals on the bed moment, but he's about to surprise her with her children. Like if I sprinkled rose petals and lit candles and had a, a bubble bath ready, and then my mom and Anna's parents were also there. <laughs> That's weird. It's super weird to surprise someone with rose petals on their bed and their children. And uh, <laughs> you know what else would be weird? If uh, Anna and her parents blindfolded you at that point. <laughs> Because that's yeah. what happens. So, yeah, so the, the kids and the dad come in. They sing happy birthday incorrectly, and then they blindfold her like they just got her a fucking firing squad and a cigarette. And they're like, we have to show you your gift. And I wanted so bad for it to be a Sibian. You know, I wanted the kids to be going like, okay, mom, now take off your panties and squat. Right. I wrote foursome with your kids. Finally. I get it. <laughs> Jesus. How Trumpian of them. Uh, but no, they take her outside where she discovers that she has a new car. How did she get home? Well, how did she not get into the house well, without yeah, noticing right, right. that there was a car wrapped in a bow outside? <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Exactly. Ugh, this film lacks the skill of a non-consensual dick pic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but they got her a Nigerian Mercedes, a.k.a. a 2008 certified pre-owned Ford Focus, and she is thrilled about it. Uh, so they're all going to go for a ride. Uh, and I guess this is scene exists so that we could establish that she's the kind of chick that likes getting new cars for her birthday because that's all we get from this scene. Yeah. Right? But is that's going to be crucial for the next scene. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> this is crucial for the next scene. <laughs> what? Because why the fuck not? So, yeah. So now we are done with that family. We are going to move back over to the stalker dude, the guy who wanted to fuck Quinn. And they're going to kill Nephi once and for all. <laughs> 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 so yeah they're all meeting up for the big gang rape i can't guess and they literally are like doing a west side story-esque like he's punching his own fist into his hand <laughs> thing yeah. like -de 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 <laughs> tonight we're gonna rape and rape and rape <laughs> crazy billionaire version of west side story too i just want to put it out there we could do oh. that as well the nigerian west side story 
spoof. That'd be awesome. Anyway, so, and I just, I want to point this out. Okay. Cause we, we literally have like seconds of movie left, but I want to point this out. So they all get ready. You know, they're like, Oh, are you ready to gang rape Quinn? I am ready to gang rape Quinn. Let us go rep, uh, gang rape Quinn. Where's her roommate? She's elsewhere, whatever. And then they all pull ski masks on. Oh my God. This is so amazing. Except for one of them <laughs> who doesn't own a ski mask. So he just takes the the beanie that he's wearing and pulls it over his face. It is the greatest. <laughs> and then the actor cannot see no, and stumbles no, off screen. <laughs> Very clearly, it's like, whoa, this mask is weird. <laughs> Movie. There's no eye holes in it at all or anything. Oh, uh, it was like rosebud. It's like something. Jonah Hill in the KKK scene. Yeah, it's right. fantastic. <laughs> also, do they sell ski masks in? <laughs> Equatorial Africa is that standard? <laughs> How did the other two guys get actual ski masks? You must order them online. It's got to okay. be a it's got to be a big business there. And then they wander off to go rape Quinn, and the movie ends. I feel like they should police that every single time somebody orders <laughs> ski masks into Nigeria. There's probably a crime <laughs> happening. Just- <laughs> preemptively arrest him yeah exactly it's got to be a, well maybe that's what happened maybe that's the why the one guy had to just pull his own hat over his face <laughs> <laughs> i guess chris brown got arrested for the, 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 the like three ski masks come on buddy so yeah and then the movie just tells you to go fuck yourself and ends yep okay and so th- the plan here is they're gonna rape quinn that's actually their plan here right i i think so but isn't she sure, who a, knows? A, an evil flame skeleton like i don't who's the good guy here the murder rape gang is the good guys right now it's not sure okay <laughs> yeah i mean I, yeah it's like that's the closest we get i guess so now does anybody want to make any predictions for what we can expect in episode four? Ooh, ooh. Uh, so l- less and less things have been happening in every movie. So I think we're just going to watch these guys drive in real time to quinn's apartment <laughs> for 53 minutes <laughs> Heath, any predictions you want to make? Uh, no, I would not like to predict anything. But I, I'm guessing maybe we'll watch them like re-knit a ski mask for the third guy like, with the holes in the right spot. Watch them play 20 questions. Is it a vegetable? <laughs> Is it a mineral? Culturally sensitive. Anyway, so, all right, so in summary this week, I'd like you to tell me what you thought of this movie, but my challenge for you is to try to do it in the form of a prayer to the great Chakra Kiki. What do you think? You got it? Mm, okay. All right. Uh, dear Chakra Kiki, um, I asked you to help with the curveball and nothing. I uh, <laughs> asked you to stop letting people switch to Geico again, nothing. I asked you to shut down that Christian lady's market, and you gave her a leg cramp. I say, fuck you, Shocker Kiki. I do it myself. I'm an atheist now. I like it. The older audience members liked it more. I'm just yeah. gonna, I'm just gonna throw that out there. Major League. Nailed it. Oh, uh, he has AIDS now, so when you think about it, the whole movie has a much darker twist. <laughs> much darker thing. Didn't need glasses. Needed a condom. <laughs> okay, my turn. My turn. My dearest Chakra Kiki, I saw you in tour in Denver in 1993, <laughs> and you guys rocked the house down. Would you mind helping me make opening arguments, get a few less views this month by killing a third of their listeners? <laughs> Love, David Smalley. <laughs> And well, that does it for our review of Wicked Vultures. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to tickle your pickle for next week. And that's not sexist, by the way. If you're a chick, I meant your clitoris, your lady pickle. So, Eli, tell us, what's on deck? Expelled. Oh, hell yeah. Live from the UK. (laughs) This is going to be our live show at QED. So if you aren't planning to be there, I'm going to do as much visual stuff as possible. A little preview. (laughs) There may oh, be some, some parkour. You just don't know. A little know. bit of this. Uh, but the movie, <laughs> the movie appears to be like a, the preview for this film is Ben Stein talking about how awesome this movie is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's like the beginning of a Kirk Cameron movie. Yeah. Yeah. He gets kicked out of class by like a stuffy atheist evolutionist. And then he's sitting outside the principal's office and the kid's like, hey, man, did you make a movie that totally proves God exists? And he's like, yeah, I did. (laughs) 
now here's me losing an argument to Richard Dawkins. Now we talk to a crazy Christian. Now scientists make didn't convince me in a single conversation that the universe starts in a place that is beyond basic comprehension. It's pretty great. That should be a lot of fun. So with all that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 61 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us a ton by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist and The Skeptocrat, available on iTunes, Stitchers, and wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars and was used with permission. If you like what you hear, hear more by following the links on the show notes for this episode. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. You got the Those are the turkeys of horror. I just want to point out. Kwame's son finally broke up with the girl who wanted $240 for sex and got a prostitute and a laptop instead. <laughs> Quinn Stalker went on to have a promising swim career. <laughs> Kwame's Thrones, Thrones, Thrones was bought out by Home Depot Nigeria <laughs> and he became the richest man in Africa. Vultures <laughs> <laughs> of horror! <laughs> Looking forward to Detroit. You can have sex with us at QED. <laughs> it's too late now, but yeah. Were those children you and Neil Brand? <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle in a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2016, all rights reserved. You bring your phone everywhere. Work, school, Shh. the movies. Now you can bring it to an Xfinity store for an easy way to switch to Xfinity Mobile, a new kind of network designed to save you money. You can get up to five lines of talk and text included with Xfinity Internet at no extra cost, so all you pay for is data. It's never been easier to switch to Xfinity Mobile and keep the phone you love. Click here to see how. Sorry, I gotta take this. Restrictions apply. Limited to select mobile phones. Requires activation of a new line of Xfinity Mobile. Up to five devices per account. New Xfinity Internet customers limited to up to two lines pending activation of Internet service.